So I wanted to talk about an idea that has in the past driven me uh, partially to madness called Zeno's Paradox. And Zeno's Paradox is a very, very, very old idea. Uh, and in fact, it dates back to the philosopher Zeno, who lived in ancient Greece, uh, and was actually uh, before Socrates even. So he lived in uh, the 400s uh, BC or BCE. Uh, and I th think even the 500s. But he was before Socrates, before Plato, before anybody. And he thought about the sort of uh, ideas about space and time that would much, much later become the underpinnings of physics. And he was sort of asking these basic questions about whether or not specific states of being even exist. And in particular, he was asking a question about whether or not motion really exists, or if it's just an illusion. And so what he came up with was this idea that how can you ever go somewhere if you have to get halfway there first, right? And if your starting location is a definite state of being, and your finishing location is a definite state of being, and your halfway point is a definite state of being, okay, well, at first that seems all honky-dory. You start in your start location. At some point in time, you reach your halfway point, and eventually you reach the finish line. That all seems, you know, to the sane, rational person that does not have a, any philosophical inclination, seems like, okay, no problems there. But if you have the kind of brain that just likes to play 4D chess with yourself and you like to overthink things, there is a little bit of a problem because, well, if you have to get halfway there, it implies that, you know, well, you also have to get halfway to being halfway there, so you have to get a quarter of the way there. And okay, well, now it's just the same problem all over again, because now what was the halfway point is now your new finish line, and you have three definite states of being, your start, your starting, your new halfway point, which was what would have been the quarter of the way, and the finish line, which is now what was, which is what was the halfway point. And in some versions of this, there's, uh, you know, the person that's starting out moving is Achilles, the legendary hero is, of course, very athletic and could move very quickly. And at the halfway point is a, is a uh, you know, a tortoise. And this is, in some respects, the origin of the tortoise and the hare story, actually. Uh, and so, you know, the idea is how will he ever pass the tortoise if he has to get halfway there first? And because he can't get halfway there if he has to get a quarter of the way there, because, of course, the next logical step is if he has to get a quarter of the way there, he has to get an eighth of the way there. And if he has to get an eighth of the way there, he has to get a sixteenth of the way there, and so on and so on and so forth. And it sort of turtles all the way down. When does that ever stop, right? And again, the saying amongst you might say, well, you know, that's stupid. You just keep moving. But again, he was asking questions about whether or not motion is real or just an illusion. And it's sort of this argument that either states of definite states of being are real. You actually are, you know, a quarter of the way there and an eighth of the way there and halfway there and a sixteenth of the way there and actually there at the finish line um, or you're not. Uh, or the process of motion must be an illusion. And in some sense, we've never really resolved this. Um, you know, it, it, it does seem paradoxical. How can you ever simultaneously say that you're definitely in any of these states of, you know, at the beginning, at the end, or halfway, and simultaneously say that it's possible to be in motion and pass through these states? Uh, and it seems pedantic, but it's actually important, uh, both for the underpinnings of physics and especially for the underpinnings of calculus. So, you know, the solution in some ways is, is real obvious, right? You say, okay, well, you know, we need to go from, you know, say zero distance to one distance. So say, you know, it's maybe a mile or, you know, pick your favorite distance and just divide it in half and then divide a half and half, which is a quarter, and then divide a quarter and half, which is an eighth, and so on and so on and so forth. And of course, all of these are going to have to just add up to one because at the end of the day, well, you know, half plus half is one, and then half is made out of a quarter plus a quarter, and then a quarter is made out of an eighth plus an eighth, and so on and so forth. So when you add all these tinier and tinier pieces together, you're just going to get one. Uh, and in fact, those of you who have taken a calculus course or learned about summing infinite series might know this formula down here where you can actually do this for any ratio. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a half, right? And so you can do it with, you know, written a couple of other things here, you know, like, um, 
you know, for, for a half, it's obvious, and you can actually do the, the problem out and, and show empirically that, uh, yes, indeed, or mathematically, sorry, you can actually prove that, you know, a half plus a quarter plus an eighth and so on and so forth converges on one. Uh, but you can also do it for, you know, a third or, uh, you know, any other fraction of the distance you want, uh, as long as you are careful about uh, how you define things. Um, but but really, it's it all comes back to this, right? You know, you're breaking it in half and then adding it back together, and then you're breaking that half and half and adding it back together, and then you're breaking that half and half and adding it back together. So you know why what you know what's 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 the worry, right? You know, you're just breaking it into pieces because of course that's the resolution to the paradox is that it's not like you stop when you get halfway there. If you actually had to stop every time you reached halfway to halfway to halfway to halfway for a fixed amount of time, like say if you had to stop half, you know, for one second at the halfway mark and stop for one second at the quarter of the way mark, then yeah, that would be infinity seconds. But you don't ever stop. But that's kind of the, the real paradox, right? Is you just, no process ever stops. So then how do you ever have any definite state of being if you're always in motion? So again, it seems like it's, the, the paradox says that either, you know, either states of being are an illusion or motion between them is an illusion. Uh, and it's actually one of the earliest examples we have of something called proof by contradiction, where you assume something and then show that the logical consequences of that assumption are absurd, so therefore it can't be true. Although in the Zeno's case, it only sort of works out. Um, but in some ways, we've never really resolved this, you know. Uh, we've developed, you know, pretty straightforward tools for actually, you know, mathematically uh, solving this problem, but we've never philosophically really quite solved it. Um, but but one thing that makes it a, a little bit clearer is when you consider the problem in, in reverse, right? Instead of saying you get to halfway and, you know, instead of saying before you get to halfway, you have to get to the quarter of the way, you say you go to halfway and then after you've gone halfway, you go halfway, and then after you've gone halfway, you go halfway, and after you've gone halfway, you've got, you go halfway, and you get the same answer, right? You get, you know, a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just gives you, you know, one of whatever distance you're dividing up into parts. So again, things seem all honky-dory, but now let's consider actually measuring distance with some sort of a, you know, a, a measuring stick, like a, like a ruler, right? Um, because, you know, I want to measure, um, I don't know, let's, you know, if I want to measure, if I want to measure, uh, <laughs> let me find something that's a, uh, you know, here, I want to measure my, uh, my uh, thingam thingamajig here, this little bean bag, you know, I take a ruler and I say, okay, you know, let me line it up with the end, okay, that's, you know, one foot, and then I put it down here, it's, oh, it's not exactly, it's not two feet either, is it? But it's it's longer than one foot, but it's less than two feet. So, okay, you know, there's inches, I divided it by 12, but okay, you know, it's not exactly, uh, not quite three more inches either, it's like three and a half, and then I look in and I say, okay, it's divided, the halves are divided into half, and, you know. And so, you know, again, for most practical questions, don't really care, you know, you just, use however much resolution you have available to you through whatever measurement device you have. And eh, sometimes you wish you had more, but by and large, there's no fundamental problem. But there is, to some extent, when you start thinking about mathematically modeling how objects move through space, right? Because um, time never stops. And, you know, some people will like to argue that we live in a simulation, right? Uh, and in that case, the solution to this is simple, which is that, you know, the simulation has some, like, finite grid to it, right? Where you eventually you do get down to fine enough resolution uh, to where, you know, you just, there is no smaller amount of space. There's like, you know, some equivalent of a pixel for the universe. And there's also some equivalent of a frame rate for the universe. And, you know, once you get down to that point, you just can't shrink things anymore. That's possible, but we have no indication that that's the case. And we've done a lot of successful mathematics assuming that that's not the case. And so that gets into sort of this this other problem, right? Which is, you know, say you have, you know, say let's say you have let me cover the this bottom half right now, but say you have a, a number line like this, right? Say you have, you know, the numbers, you know, one to ten. Well, you know, 
what about the numbers in between, <laughs> right? What about the distances in between, right? Because you could always you could always zoom in more, right? Say this this actually happens to be you know ten inches that I've drawn on here, but let's say you know ten you know let's say in, you know we, we want to measure distance more precisely than just one inch, and you say okay you know okay well, let's say you know you know instead of inches let's say you know point one inches, and let's say you know um, you know. Uh, it's, you know, let's zoom in between the four inch mark and the six inch mark around the five inch mark. because so we're looking at these halfway points, right? So now we have 4.0 to 6.0 and we have everything measured in increments of, you know, 0 0.1 inches. Well, but maybe that's not good enough. So let's zoom in, zoom in some more. And now we have four point, now we have uh, 4.9 to 5.1. And we say, okay, you know, but maybe that's not good enough. And now, so now that we're going from 4.9 to 5.1, now we're measuring increments of 0 0.01 inches. And then we might say, well, maybe that's not good enough. And maybe we want to look at an even tinier little region here. And we want to look at four, you know, 4.99 to 5.01. And then we're measuring in units of 0 0.001 inches. And it's like, where do you stop? Well, if you're just doing some most practical things, you stop at the limit of whatever your instruments can measure. You have some fancy calipers or some other thing, and, you know, it can only measure down to, you know, say maybe a thousandth of an inch at best. And, uh, you know, you just stop there. But if you're actually considering this philosophical problem of like, you know, because remember, the, the, way that, the way that we fix this is we just said that, oh yeah, the, the way that we fixed Zeno's paradox is we just said, oh yes, yes, whatever, you know, it's, we're decomposing it into half and half and half and half and half, uh, but it still just all adds up to one and, you know, you never actually stop at the halfway point, you just have to get there and you just move right through it. And you might say, well, there's this, you know, un slightly unsettling philosophical question about, you know, okay, well, if you only just move through it, then how do you ever really exist in any definite state of being in the first place? And that's the idea that uh, sort of drove me to madness at one point. Um, but, you know, uh, but what if we look even deeper, right? What if we start asking, you know, these questions about like, okay, you say I move, we're moving through it, but I'll just zoom in further and further and further and further, um, you know, what uh, what happens? You know, do you eventually zoom in so much that uh, you can't get any more decimal places and you reach the resolution of the universe, uh, the spatial resolution and the temporal resolution? Well, we haven't been able to do it. It doesn't seem like anything like that exists. It seems like you can zoom in infinitely far and there is just more and more and more digits, right? And so recall, um, there are different ways of representing a partial quantity, right? There's, you know, if you can consider just a simple number line like this, again, these happen to be spaced one inch apart, but now we're just considering them as numbers, not as actual distances. So there's, you know, the integers, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and also all of the negative integers, which if you do want to consider distance, all, you know, a negative distance is, is just, you know, distance in the opposite direction, right? So, you know, say, you know, positive distance is this direction, negative distance is that direction. But we don't need to worry about negative numbers for this. We just need to worry about how you represent a quantity that's a quantity that's smaller than one. And so, of course, you might say, okay, yeah, yeah, it's just, you know, they're fractions, right? You know, like, and, you know, you have, you know, a third, and I have, you know, just written a bunch of random fractions here. Uh, but remember, fractions always repeat, right? So, you know, famously, one third is just 0 0.33333 repeating forever. And so it can't be nicely written as, because remember, dec a decimal number really is, is it's representing a number as fractions of 10, right? You know, 0 0.3333 means, you know, 1 plus 3 over 10 plus 3 over 100 plus 3 over 1,000, etc., 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 etc. And so, you know, if you all you're doing is just converting one type of fraction to another type of fraction, where, you know, you want to say, if I wanted to represent this as fractions that are all multiples of 10, what does that look like? And you always get some rel relatively simple pattern. Three, you know, one third is just three repeating forever. Pick to the random fraction four sevenths here, which has a complicated six digit pattern that it repeats, but nevertheless, it's just six digits and you just keep repeating those six digits over and over forever. Um, but when you zoom in on a number line like this, you get numbers that 
don't follow a simple pattern like that, right? And in fact, most of the numbers you find aren't like that. Because remember, there's numbers like the square root of 2 and pi that don't have any pattern like this, right? They never repeat, right? Pi is 3.1415926 something, something, something. And there's never a repeating pattern, like ever. It just keeps going and going and going. I mean, you might happen to find the same sequence of digits twice in a row or something, but there's never there's never any cons I say there's never any consistent pattern. It just keeps going and going and going. And so these these are what we call continuum numbers, or these are technically called transcendental numbers. But there's there's basically there's basically two kinds of infinity, right? There's what we call countable infinities, which are things like integers and fractions, where I can actually write down in principle, there's an infinite number of them, but you can, you know, think of a way to write them all down, right? The integers just say 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc., 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 you know, keep going forever and you'll never get to infinity, but you know what to do each time you want to step forward. Uh, same thing with fractions, right? You just have, you know, two numbers instead of one, right? You know, one number divided by another number and you just keep going forever and you have, you know, kind of twice as many to go through, but it's all honky-dory. Uh, when you zoom in like this, it's not, it's not just two numbers divided by each other. So, you know, sort of effectively counting, it's not exactly, you know, even fractions are more than counting to infinity twice, but, you know, basically just, you know, Two, two, two numbers, both of which can go from zero to infinity. It's an infinite number of infinitely many numbers, you know, which if that doesn't make sense, it's because it doesn't. It just does not make sense. This does not make sense. You just keep zooming in further and further and further and further. And so remember, we were talking about this problem of what happens when you get halfway there. Well, nothing happens, but the answer isn't that you can never get there because you can never get halfway there. Everybody knows if you want to go somewhere, you just go there. The question is, how do you deal with specifying any state of being when A, you never actually stay in any state of being, and B, no matter how much you zoom in, no matter how specific you try to be, you'll never be able to say exactly where something is. And if you really think about it, it's kind of maddening. And it turns out that dealing with this problem eventually turns into some of the underpinnings of calculus, right? Because the way that you deal with this to some extent in calculus is you consider an infinitely small quantity and you use it to analyze, um, you know, some process like this where you're adding up you know, infinitely, an infinite number of infinitely small pieces, and you can do some interesting stuff that's very useful in physics. But the philosophical sort of issues never really got resolved. Uh, it's, you know, we kind of found a way out of the paradox, which is the solution that's always been known, which is stop playing 4D chess with your own brain. You just go to the place. Um, but then it always begs the question, well, how do you ever exist in an indefinite state of being? And the answer is always like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, if you can experience something, it must be real. Um, and that's the closest thing to an answer we have. But uh, I don't know. It uh, still drives me to madness sometimes. So, uh, yeah. Bye.